Jerke Verschoor and welcome to this uh, Dutch Science Talks. If you can hear me, if you can see me, please uh, write something in the chat. Uh, perhaps the city where you are listening in from. We're always interested to see where our audience is from. Um, so please feel free to write that. Uh, I see people typing, so that means that you can hear me. Uh, so again, my name is Jerke Verschoor. I'm the director of the Netherlands Education Support Office in Moscow. Um, um, and we work on internationalization and education between uh, Russia, the Netherlands, uh, also a little bit in Kazakhstan and Belarus. Um, and we bring you tonight another one of our Dutch science talks. And we're very happy that so many of you showed up tonight. Um, we organize uh, these lectures together with the Netherlands Embassy in Moscow and tonight also with the Netherlands Institute in St. Petersburg. Uh, so we're very happy to have uh, these co-hosts. Um, and we bring you a very interesting lecture today uh, with two very nice speakers and I will introduce them both to you. Uh, we have uh, Professor Elena O'Malley, who is the Chair of United Nations Studies in Peace and Justice at Leiden University in the Netherlands. Uh, she is a historian focusing on the United Nations, decolonization, Congo and the Cold War. Now, her first book, The Diplomacy of Decolonization, America, Britain and the United Nations during the Congo Crisis, was recently named one of the top 20 best new diplomacy books to read in 2020. So it should be on your reading list. Now, currently, she is working on a new project challenging the liberal world order from within the invisible history of the, Uni of the United Nations and the Global South. Now, our second speaker. Uh, is Professor Yegor Sergeyev, who is a senior lecturer at the Department of Global Economy at M. Guimont University, uh, well known to most of you, I assume, and he obtained his both uh, degrees and PhD in economics there. Now, his research uh, interests uh, lie primarily in the area of economy of the EU, economic and political systems uh, of the Benelux countries, uh, Belgium, Netherlands and Luxembourg, regional integration in Europe, financial integration in the EU and regional differentiation of the EU. And he will speak tonight uh, about the United Nations role in global economic governance, problems and prospects. But first we start with Professor O'Malley, uh, whom I like to invite to turn on her uh, sound and video. And she will talk about the United Nations at 75, an empty vessel or still an essential vehicle. And as you know, the United Nations is celebrating its 75th anniversary this year. So we're very happy to have Professor O'Malley with us. Um, I will turn on uh, your presentation, uh, Professor O'Malley, and then the floor is yours. There it is. Thank you. Thank you, Jorge. Thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, and good evening to all of you from uh, the Netherlands and from The Hague. Um, my name is uh, Alana O'Malley and uh, you already um, heard my biography from Jurke, very generous, and um, I'm very happy to talk to you tonight. Um, and I hope to give you something to think about for the next 45 minutes, um, precisely also at this moment of the 75th anniversary of the UN. So first I'm going to explain a little bit about who I am, where I'm from, and why we're talking about the UN today. And then I'm going to take you through some of the common ideas about the UN and about its, um, how it's understood everywhere. And then I'm going to take you through some of the problems with that and what we might do to change our minds about the UN um, by the end of this talk. So um, I look forward to your questions and um, I'm just going to uh, start straight away now by saying that um, I have a special chair. Uh, so it's a special professorship in United Nations Studies and Peace and Justice. And this is a position that was created by the city of The Hague, The Hague being one of the UN cities in the world, um, to really um, honor the work of the former mayor, but also to increase the profile of The Hague as a UN city. So we've been really thinking about what does it mean to be a UN city, but also why is The, um, why is the Hague uh, a UN city and what does the UN mean now in 2020? So this is a position based both at Leiden University and at the Hague University of Applied Sciences. And in that way, it tries to bring together different types of perspectives and views of the UN um, and really rethink what we know. So um, to give you um, kind of a, a first uh, shot, if I was there with you in the room or if we would happen to be gathered somewhere physical, um, I would ask you, what do you think of when you first think about the United Nations? And most people say blue helmets or peacekeepers or peacekeeping um, 
or more skeptical people often say um, Rwanda or Bosnia. So they, they name um, a genocide or um, a, a violent conflict where there has been mass killing, where the UN hasn't been able to do anything. Um, and other people often say, well, um, bureaucracy, um, a, a, an institution that's very far away from us, that has no relevance to us, um, and also a place that um, is full of boring and diplomats um, in suits negotiating. And this is the image that you see um, in the bottom corner of your screen. Um, and it's true that all of these images do represent the UN, but they're also problematic images, right? So um, these are um, images that really develop a negative impression of what the UN does. So yes, the UN um, performs peacekeeping, oftentimes not very well, um, in the sense that it really has a very checkered record on peacekeeping, right? So we see some peacekeeping missions, they don't actually provide peace to a solution to a, a solution to a conflict. So even where peacekeeping missions are more active and the peacekeepers are involved in peacemaking, efforts. Um, oftentimes it's quite limited what they can achieve. Um, we also see, as I mentioned, some, you know, um, terrible circumstances um, where there are large scale killings perpetrated by state and non-state actors that the UN either hasn't been able to intervene, hasn't done so on time, or does so kind of ineffectually um, after the genocide has passed or after mass killings have taken place. And obviously the example that I mentioned for that that always comes to mind is Rwanda. We could also think about Bosnia. We could also think now about uh, Yemen, about um, Syria, uh, about um, Libya and many other places where the UN either is there in a very limited capacity or is, is not there uh, in any kind of um, performative capacity. So peacekeeping, yes, the UN does it, but it's very problematic and the record is very unclear. On the other hand, bureaucracy is a part of international politics. Unfortunately, bureaucracy seems to be a part of every job now. But the kind of bureaucracy that the UN gets criticised for is um, the kind of production of reports that nobody reads, um, the endless debates in Security Council that nobody listens to, um, and kind of, again, that kind of sense of distance from real politics, distance from relevance to people's lives. Um, and these are all things, as I said, that are certainly accurate in terms of what the UN does, but my argument today will be that these are not only what the UN does. And actually what we've ended up with after 75 years of the UN and of, of, of thinking and talking about the UN um, in many places around the world are that the UN has become kind of stereotyped by these images, right? So we kind of get locked into this negative, um, I would say misconception of what the UN does by only thinking about it in these terms. So how do we get out of that box? Well, the first thing I want to do is to show you this image. Now, I'm, you know, you're not meant to read every line on it and I'm, it's not the best image that uh, there could be, but it is the, the, at the moment, the current image of the UN system. And why I'm showing you this is, I'm just going to direct your attention towards that orange box, if you follow the arrow from the Security Council. And in that orange box are um, the various committees and the various associated criminal tribunals that work with the Security Council. But all the other boxes and all the other agencies, departments, offices, commissions, bodies, etc., that's what the UN does outside the Security Council. So the first thing that we have to think about when we think about the UN is to move away from those kind of negative stereotypes, which although true are problematic, and rather get a, a kind of a fuller impression of what it is the UN does. And the UN performs better in these other sectors, certainly in the General Assembly um, committees and the various specialized agencies and programs and funds, but it also performs um, more work, okay? So it does more and it does better on these other dimensions of its um, record of performance. Now, What's the problem with this? Well, firstly, um, mostly, if you were to open any newspaper, turn on a TV show, or um, TV news, or a blog, or um, wherever you get your news, then you see that the, the negative stereotypes of the UN are often perpetuated. So you don't hear very much about, for instance, what these specialized agencies are doing in, for example, the conflicts that I mentioned in Syria, or Yemen, or um, Libya. 
So we have this problem that we want to talk about the UN and we want to talk about its relevance at 75 years, but we're working really against the grain of this conventional understanding, which is that the UN only works in the Security Council and isn't very good at what it does there. So what I wanted to introduce you to today was um, a way of thinking about the UN now that's a little bit different than what we've heard before and how doing so really opens the door to understanding more fully the UN system, but also um, to giving us a better grounding for those criticisms. Because if we are going to criticize it and reform it, and I'm going to talk about reform of the Security Council as well, then we have to firstly start from the position of what it was mandated to do or what it was created for in 1945, but also what it really does now. So beyond just looking at the Security Council. So um, why is this a kind of a fortuitous or an important moment to talk about the UN? Well, of course, we're at the 75th anniversary. Um, uh, just now in October, we had um, 75 years since the uh, charter was signed into being. Um, the Hague, of course, has a long historical legacy, not just with the UN, but with international organizations um, and with international law, which is, of course, um, the kind of, you know, if you like, the golden thread that runs through um, a lot of what the UN does. So arguably, this is a, an important moment for a balanced and a critical appraisal. Um, and so, again, what I'm trying to kind of do is overturn those kind of stereotypical views and those traditional critiques and rather give us a kind of a different, um, but yet also critical moment. So where are we now with the UN? Well, uh, we're at an interesting juncture, okay? So obviously, as we know, um, the apple cart was kind of upset four years ago when Donald Trump, instead of Hillary Clinton, got elected. Now, he has had an interesting relationship with the United Nations. And so you see this picture of him kind of grinning like a buffoon before the General Assembly. Um, and his General Assembly addresses have been interesting because they just haven't really been taken very seriously. And this is very unusual. So from 1945 onwards, the United States had a very close relationship with the United Nations. Obviously, um, American officials from the State Department were um, heavily involved in drafting the charter and in really creating a lot of political energy around fortifying the wartime alliance um, and, and institutionalizing state power. And that was really the idea of kind of creating the UN. So it's kind of an organization that would manage um, power politics and where states could actually negotiate their national interests together. Now, this, of course, came out of the ashes of the Second World War um, as a moment really which exemplifies the importance and what is now called the spirit of multilateralism. Um, and in many cases, in many ways, the um, term of Donald Trump uh, ongoing as it is, of course, um, for now, uh, really kind of did a lot of damage to that spirit of multilateralism. It's important to remember that this is definitely not the first time that the United States had a kind of a check or record of relationship with the United Nations. Um, it, it kind of ebbed and flowed that the US interest in the UN over time. Um, but Donald Trump really, I think, did a lot of damage to the US position, um, really not just by criticizing quite publicly the UN and its failures. And we saw that a lot um, during the last few months, of course, because he criticized the WHO very heavily over the, their performance on COVID. Um, but we also see in a more kind of tangible um, diplomatic sense, really the abdication of leadership by the US in a lot of different committees. Now, this was very heavily criticized and we saw all kinds of headlines about, you know, the end of the liberal world order um, and how devastating this was for the role of the US in the world. But m my argument today is that, and I think that this is an important one to remember, there's no reason why we should be talking about the United Nations and US power in the same breath every time we talk about the UN. Because there are, of course, four other permanent members, Russia, of course, being another one. And there are another, you know, altogether, there's, there's more than 190 member states. So we really have to try to think about um, what are the other states doing at the UN and what maybe if we can escape this kind of constant um, and rather circular debate about the liberal world order, we could, in fact, think about the fact that most people who have lived in the liberal world since 1945 
have not experienced it as liberal. So from 1960 onwards, two thirds of the United Nations members have been those members and actors from the Global South countries. So this really incorporates actors from Latin America, from Asia and Southeast Asia and across also the continent of Africa. And people in these nation states don't experience the UN as something positive. They don't experience the liberal world order as liberal. They find it, in fact, quite oppressive in many cases. Um, and they really feel that this is kind of a narrative that kind of is espoused by the West about the UN. So all of these ideas, these classical ideas about um, the UN and the US kind of being tied up together in the debate, I think has also muddied the water about what the UN has done uh, in these countries and what it can do in the future. So some of these traditional ideas do hold clear and we do see the UN really providing an important forum and a space for the battle of ideas um, and certainly acting as a defender of nation states. So sovereignty really still is um, the key building block, if you like, of actors within the UN. But on a lot of issues, what we see is that there are in fact far more dynamic activities and debates between the other members than there are uh, between the permanent five. And that has led to a lot of kind of stagnated debates about the relevance of the UN and reform of the Security Council, which again, I will um, talk about in a minute. So we're at this moment now where it seems that there might be a change in power um, in the United States. The United States, of course, being important at the UN, I would say mostly because it's the primary funder of the UN. So a lot of other countries either um, don't pay their contributions on time or don't pay them at all. Um, so that has really caused a lot of problems. So yes, the American election is important for the future of the UN, but I would say only from the perspective of thinking of the US alongside the other members, not as the only and most important power in that forum. There is also um, a kind of a, a critical argument that could be made that, in fact, do we really want a resurgence of the liberal world order by Joe Biden and his team? I'm not going to go too much into that debate, but what I, I will say is that this has led also to quite valid criticisms of the UN right now. So if we, if we detach ourselves from that debate about liberal world order for a minute, we can look at actually how the UN has functioned even in the last decade. So we've had kind of major abuse of the veto system in the Security Council. Of course, um, I know that you are very well versed in the UN and you know the veto system, which is that um, the five permanent members, that is Russia, China, the United States, the United Kingdom and France, have a veto power over every resolution that comes before the Security Council. So this means that they can veto the resolution and it doesn't get passed and then the Security Council has to go either back to the drawing board on a particular question or it's just kind of left helpless. Um, now, the veto system has been hugely criticized because in many cases, um, it leaves the UN kind of toothless because um, unanimous uh, passing of the unanimous votes are needed. And if one power vetoes something, then it's basically off the table. So we've seen huge abuse of the veto um, by Security Council members acting to protect their own interests. Um, and in fact, the record is kind of interesting and I hope that this comes up, I'm sure it will come up in the questions, but of course, as you will also know, Russia has the strongest record of use of the um, veto um, being 116 times uh, since 1945. And this is quite a high number compared to the US, which is 81 vetoes, um, UK 29, um, France 16 and China uh, 16. So we see a lot of use of the veto by permanent five members trying to protect their interests. And interestingly, um, this is something that really, of course, holds back the UN from acting, especially in a humanitarian emergency. And we saw that quite a lot on Syria, where um, the veto power was used to prohibit the UN from uh, providing humanitarian aid. But we also see that the Security Council hasn't really been effective in meeting the challenges of the current pandemic. And so it was um, quite late in the pandemic that actually the Security Council uh, agreed to meet or was able to meet to discuss the crisis. Um, so you see, even on human security questions that are relevant to, directly relevant to the permanent five members, uh, we still have a huge amount of disagreement. Um, 
we've seen them kind of over time, of course, what this culminates in is a failure to prevent the escalation of conflict, certainly a failure to resolve conflict. Um, and in a lot of cases, the argument from the other non-permanent members of the Security Council, the 10 non-permanent members who are elected on a rotating basis, is that the Security Council remains wholly unrepresentative. So how can you have um, these permanent five members essentially deciding everything that the council, and in many cases, you know, thinking of the way that everybody thinks about the, the UN, does that mean that the UK, UN can only do what the council says? So these are the issues in front of us, that even if we have a kind of a, a new administration in the US that breathes new life into the UN, or we have more um, active participation of the other permanent five members, because we did see the spirit of multilateralism kind of rising up from France and the UK much more strongly when the US wasn't taking a leading role. What we see on the other side is that China is also becoming increasingly engaged in the United Nations. China is one of the top troop contributing countries for peacekeeping now, um, and they are really expanding their role in the organization. Russia, on the other hand, really in, still um, has this kind of uh, view of the UN as something I think that is quite um, unwieldy, that is very old fashioned, um, and that really they have used their, their veto power to oftentimes really prevent the UN from performing quite strongly. So they're not interested, or it seems, that Russia is not interested in really kind of having a, a strong UN. So there, in this regard, then, we're kind of locked in this very kind of traditional debate about national interests and about state power and about conventional positions. So how do we get out of this? And, and, and how do we move on from these debates to try to think about the role of the other members? Well, my argument is that History is incredibly important. And I'm sorry for the book covers. So it's a, it's a really, uh, it's a plug on my part. Um, but I, I wanted to give you the impression that um, this is really an interesting field of scholarship, a field of study. So we're now at the point where the UN is getting attention from um, historians who want to explain more than what it has and has not done. So we're, we're going beyond this kind of conventional story of successes and failures. And we're getting a bit more into the nitty gritty. And that means getting a bit more involved in what states have done at the UN rather than what the UN has not done in states. And that's essentially um, the kind of perspective that I'm coming back. Um, and I think this is also interesting because we can think about our traditional views of states and use this as a way to turn that on its head. So um, given that the location of this talk, I thought it would be interesting today to talk about um, a little bit about uh, Russia's role at the United States, at the United Nations. So, so what, what I just mentioned is that yes, Russia uses the veto power quite a lot. They're not interested in having a strong United Nations. Um, and in many ways, they act in a kind of an inhibiting role within the Security Council. And that's very much the, the perspective um, of a lot of scholars and a lot of a kind of kind of man on the street about Russia's role at the UN. OK, um, and my argument is that, well, this is not the full story. OK, so, yes, Russia does make these decisions at times, but it also historically has been a very interesting actor at the UN. So this, uh, these are two photos that I want to kind of talk about um, from the UN archive and, and showing the Soviet Union um, in 1949 and then 1960. Um, and I think this gives us a very different impression of what the Soviet Union was doing at the United Nations, um, at least uh, in a very limited sense. We don't have time for a full history here. Um, but I want to give you two moments to think about that might um, give us some background on the Russian position right now, but would also... Um, give us some perspective um, um, to get us out of that kind of conventional view. So the first photo that we see there is uh, Nikita Khrushchev, and he's um, standing up uh, and he actually interrupts the speech of uh, the British Prime Minister Harold Macmillan. And this is a debate on the Congo um, in September 1960. Now, the classic and really inaccurate image of the Soviet Union at the UN, and I, I think that many of you would have seen this, is Khrushchev holding up his shoe. I don't have a shoe uh, to <laughs> demonstrate this, but we could do it in person sometime. And there's this image where he's holding up his shoe and he's banging it on the table to signal his discontent with the debate uh, on the Congo. Um, 
this is it's really unknown whether or not this ever happened right i mean it's kind of a, an old wives tale if you like and certainly in this image here which is the official record of the meeting he's not banging anything on the table except perhaps uh, his fist and he's interrupting the, the debate on the congo because he's really objecting to the kind of the way the mission has gone on um uh in the congo crisis in the 1960s um but why um is this important well i'm trying to highlight here that um this conventional view of Russia at the UN um, really doesn't reflect that Russia has been um, a critical participant within the UN system for a very long time, but certainly a participant, not an observer, not an outsider, and certainly not a state that just sits back uh, even at the Security Council. And Khrushchev, of course, um, arrived at the General Assembly in 1960 um, quite unexpectedly i mean he was uh, he took a, a ship so they knew he was coming but this was really um uh, an unusual uh, decision um and he felt so strongly about what was happening in the congo that he felt that personal representation at the general assembly was important um also for russia's own interests in the cold war of course but as a way of signaling engagement not just with the un but with what is happening in uh what is now called the global south so Russia has been very active in these debates about decolonization through the 60s and the 70s. In many cases, the Soviet Union um, acted at the UN as um, a kind of a binding force. They voted in many cases with members of the Global South against the West on issues regarding economic sovereignty. Um, they were um, active around the founding of the G77, the Group of 77 and the General Assembly. Um, and in many cases, if you look at their voting record, it's Russia who votes with the Global South countries against oftentimes the US and the UK who had different post-colonial interests in those spaces. So this is, again, as I say, it's not a full impression of the Russian role at the UN, but what I'm trying to do is to get us out of that traditional idea that Russia is only an obstructionist state or that the, the Soviet Union um, in the past um, played a similar role of only playing Cold War politics at the UN. And here you see that they're doing actually much more than that. They're, they're also doing Cold War politics, but there's more underneath that veil than we traditionally understood. The second image is um, the signatories um, of the kind of the Genocide Convention in 1949, which was, of course, um, a hugely important moment in the UN history. And we see the Ukrainian, the Belarusian, and the Soviet ambassadors uh, signing the convention, I should say, with um, reservation, right? So they are uh, signatories there with reservation. But again, I wanted to highlight here um, the kind of um, the role of the Soviet Union in kind of bringing together, if you like, um, rightly or wrongly, a lot of um, allies in that sphere, but also the, their engagement on issues that go beyond national interest. And the signing of the Genocide Convention was something um, as I said, which was a hugely significant moment in the UN's history for human rights um, and for um, the, the, this kind of question uh, in the Global South countries. So taking these two moments, again, very selective, um, just uh, to give you an impression, I wanted to show you that the Soviet Union actually played a very kind of interesting role um, and was a very dynamic actor rather than a static one that only played Cold War politics through the UN's history. So where does that bring us up to today? Well, um, this is uh, really kind of an image, um, if you like, that plays into that traditional idea of Russia as an abstentionist. And this is the um, permanent representative of the Federation um, really voting for um, uh, voting against the extension of targeted Yemen sanctions in February. Um, and here I, I chose to show you an image of an abstention rather than a veto because an abstention at the Security Council really um, is a, way, a state's way of signaling their discontent with the resolution, but they're not so unhappy that they will actually veto it. So some progress can be made on those questions through negotiations afterwards. Um, so Essentially, what we see here is that, again, this is, it's not a, a veto, it's not a, voting for the resolution, but it's an abstention. So it's an example of another role 
that the so that, that Russia has played at the Security Council um, on issues that are directly relevant and to their national interests. Now, I don't really want to get in too much to uh, Russia's performance on these questions about Yemen or Syria, but I'm just trying to show you that um, there's no such thing as a traditional position for the UN for, for states at the UN that they always do exactly the same thing. In fact, uh, each decision is weighed very carefully, um, and a lot of times states will. Um, uh, really try to um, balance national interests against international priorities. But we, even where there are, they feel their national interests are directly challenged, they will provide some room to maneuver. And that's what the abstention really offers, is room to maneuver for other states and actors around that question. So this really um, it kind of brings me to make a kind of a broader pro point really about my wider research. Um, this is the, 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 the issue that I'm kind of currently thinking about. Um, if we go beyond this kind of liberal international order, which is supposed to signify what the UN has done for the last 75 years, um, I'm interested in the global south aspect, but this could also be applied to many other countries, is that within and between these actors at the UN, there's a lot of space for negotiation. And we don't know an awful lot about um, remembering even at the Security Council of the General Assembly, these are performative chambers. So we don't really know an awful lot about the process of diplomacy and lobbying that goes on behind these positions. So we should not forget that UN politics is in inherently performative, but at the same time, um, behind those performed positions is really where the interesting spaces are. And I'm interested in kind of what I, uncovering what I call the invisible history, because I think that those processes have been and deliberately obscured from public view um, in order to protect states' interests and protect their kind of uh, their image and their their prestige. And I'm really interested in that going on between the Global South countries and the UN over time. Importantly, though, I think I hope that this is a, a um, something that has come across in, in the way that I've kind of framed this uh, debate for you. Is I think we have to get out of this um, kind of Western perspective of what the UN is. So as much as we don't know an awful lot about the lobbying and the private and public interests that go into UN positioning, we also don't really know an awful lot about non-Western countries at the UN, and that includes Russia. So there are some very good histories um, of Russian performance at the UN, um, but we need more. And we need, we need those histories to be more widely acceptable, and more, more widely readable and accessible. Um, and the importance of going beyond that Western perspective is that firstly, um, most of the UN's members are not Western powers. Um, secondly, I think that as long as we continue to perpetuate Western views, and by that I mean in looking only at Western motivations, Western actors, focusing on this debate about the US and the US elections and what it means for the UN, then we're perpetuating that image that the UN is just a tool of Western power. Whereas exactly um, really what we want to talk about is what it can be in the future, um, because it hasn't been in the past simply a Western actor. Um, and then thinking about that, that will give us some insight into understanding how the UN both facilitates the role of actors and how it limits debates on other questions, and in that way shapes global order. So now kind of we're facing a kind of a, a new horizon of challenges in the 21st century for the UN, um, specifically now after this pandemic moment. Um, and we need to understand fully, in order to tackle those challenges, we need to understand how the UN embraces some actors, so brings some actors as legitimate players to the table, but also delegitimizes others and disenfranchises those actors from their voice. And in this way, I would argue that the UN actually plays an incredibly important role in shaping global order. It's not just about states. You have to ask, what happens to the states that don't get invited to the negotiation table? What about those actors who don't get invited to the negotiation table? What about those issues that never come before the Security Council? What about those issues that um, get debated at the General Assembly but then get thrown out? So these are the kind of questions that I think we have to understand if we're going to really um, develop a full kind of impression of what the UN can be. So having debates about Security Council reform is fine, but it's very, very limited because if we don't know already fully what the UN does, then we can't possibly hope to anticipate what it might do in the future. Just thinking about that future, um, one of the, the kind of questions that I, I think um, we might think about 
uh, in terms of developing a different role for the UN is the whole issue of the sustainable development goals. So these goals, of course, um, have been uh, negotiated between states um, and they're supposed to be achieved by 2030. It looks extremely ambitious now, especially in light of the pandemic. But I think these goals are an important roadmap for states. So it really kind of emphasizes the importance of global governance questions. And that's what we need the UN for. Um, so that really uh, brings me, I think, to the end of my time. Um, and um, I thank you for your attention and I welcome your questions. And then you see my Twitter handle if you want to um, reach out to me before or after the event. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Elena, for uh, giving us a broader scope of uh, of the UN. Um, and I, I really liked the fact that you touched upon some of the of the of the Russian uh, part of uh, of its role in the in the United Nations. Uh, we got quite a few questions, and uh, I would like to say to the uh, listeners, we will uh, ask them uh, after the uh, lecture by uh, Yegor Yegor Sergeyev. So I would like to invite uh, Professor Sergeyev, please, uh, while Elena, you can turn off your camera and your sound for now. Um, I will turn on the presentation from Professor Sergeyev, um, and he is coming online now. Uh, you can hear us, Professor Sergeyev? Yes, I can. Okay, and we can hear you. So please uh, uh, take it away from your side, and afterwards we will have uh, the Q&A. Okay, so good evening everyone, greetings from Moscow. My name is Yegor Sergeyev. Um, I'm senior lecturer at the Department of World Economy uh, at Mgimo University. Our university is primarily uh, studying uh, some global problems, international relations, international finance, international economics, world economy, and so on and so forth. So as you could hear from the introduction, I'm not um, studying the UN, uh, but uh, mostly the world financial system. So my today's um, presentation will focus on the financial architecture of the world and the place the UN has in this architecture. So the my presentation would um, concern some economic um, sides of what the UN does. So um, <clears throat> let me pass on to the topic. Actually, when we're speaking about uh, global economic governance, we're speaking about um, mechanisms to govern, to regulate, to control some global economic, political, social problems and processes. So the uh, world economic system has become so uh, intertwined, so sophisticated, that, it's ne that it needs to be somehow regulated. But the problem is actually that there are many and many uh, actors, many stakeholders, which enter the world arena, the, which enter the globe. Um, and a fundamental problem for the U United Nations is that actually some of the actors, some of the stakeholders are not states. They are non-state actors. They, they could be business actors. They could be um, mass media owned by businesses, owned by states, uh, owned by uh, um, uh, their own, and, and so on and so forth. So the uh, <clears throat> system in which many, many actors operate is rather sophisticated. Um, the actors actually could be split into some um, groups or some types, and all of those types are influential to some extent, more or less, so there are actually for, formal institutions which could take part in global economic governance. So institutions which could um, govern and regulate some economic processes which uh, occur globally. Uh, naturally, when we speak about the United Nations, we speak about international economic organizations. There are many of them, some of them are like financial of nature, like the IMF, the World Bank, um, they could be special uh, UN agencies like the IMF or World Bank, uh, or they could stay apart like World Trade Organization. So there are many of them, and actually, as we could see a bit later, they all have their own uh, kind of specialization in the world economy. Um, then, when speaking, when we are speaking about formal state of state waves of cooperation, we naturally speak about regional integration. 
there are also many of them and the uh, growth in number uh, was uh, to be seen in the 90s and in the 2000s. So there are many international uh, regional integration groups like the European Union, like the Eurasian Economic Union, like, I don't know, Association of Southeast Asian Nations and so on and so forth. So they also have their own world economy. They also have their own role. They would like to influence the global processes. So they could also act as stakeholders in a global economic governance. So um, speaking about non-state formal actors. So the uh, division into formal and informal actors is actually a bit maybe too simple, but still it uh, uh, allows us to understand what happens uh, in global economic governance. Uh, so some formal non-state actors are represented mostly by non-governmental organizations, which also um, have some power. Uh, it is mostly normative. So they create norms which are, um, which are respected and uh, which represent some bit of view of those organizations. Like they could be environmental, they could be of human rights nature and so on and so forth. Then um, we speak about uh, some business actors. Um, for instance, the uh, multinational enterprises or the European notion for this, European name for this notion as transnational corporations or companies. Uh, they co also could uh, influence the world economy since they concentrate some trade flows, they uh, concentrate production, they um, make investments uh, all over the world. So we all know many multinational enterprises entering our domestic markets like I don't know, Microsoft, Apple, um, and so on and so forth. Then uh, a very influential power are rating agencies. National economies nowadays are dependent of uh, national sovereign ratings. So there are many um, rating agencies like Fitch, Moody's, Standard & Poor's, which give ratings to the economies. So some economists could be trusted, some of them uh, could be not. So rating agencies are also very important and very influential. And we have mass media. Um, if we're speaking about formal state to non-state cooperation, um, um, has mentioned sustainable development goals, and this is actually one of the key issues in current development agenda. Uh, then there are naturally some informal institutions, quasi-formal institutions like G20, 77, the BRICS countries. Um, so those groups uh, comprised of states are not international economic organizations, but they are influential. Like G20 actually um, deals with almost parts of anti-crisis financial agenda, uh, meaning financial crisis of 2008-2009. Uh, Non-state informal actions are represented by experts society. Like we are nowadays um, uh, try to um, make um, global governance through experts' opinion change. Um, then there are some business associations and clubs. There are some global initiatives, like climate initiative or Kimberley process. Uh, and there are also some talk or temporal measures which uh, also could begin to meet some certain problems uh, within the uh, global economy. The then role is mostly um, in um, making targets and making the overall development agenda. So sustainable development goals is actually um, the current uh, global agenda for uh, all countries over the world. So actually, basically, uh, all activities by other uh, institutions of global governance um, should meet those sustainable development and should uh, take them into account. Uh, but actually, there is a kind of uh, global division of labor between some institutions. Under you know, labor, we mean specialization. So uh, there are different economic problems within the society, the world <clears throat> arena, and there are actually organizations specialized in dealing with those problems. 
like global development agenda is mostly dominated by the United Nations since it adopted the global development goals. But to some extent, World Bank also deals with development. So it gives credits to countries, it gives grants. There are um, several bodies within the World Bank, but still, um, it deals primarily with development and primarily with developing countries. Global, global regulation, so regulation agenda, meaning what should we do to uh, stabilize uh, world financial system, is dominated by trading. So major uh, global initiatives to um, regulate some financial flows, uh, financial regulations within the society, financial stability, this one is dominated by uh, G20. And then the global financial agenda. Um, the International Monetary Fund is uh, primarily in charge of world financial agenda, of global financial agenda, since it deals with um, external financial stability of uh, some countries. So it gives um, credits to countries where they have unbal unbalanced budget, where they have difficulties with their international debt, and so on. So the UN has no responsibilities here, almost no responsibilities here. So this is this problem is in charge of the IMF. Then a, a relatively new agenda for um, economic governance uh, deals with taxation. Actually, nowadays, due to digitalization of world economy, some nations, some economists, um, don't know what to do and how to tax um, global digital multinational enterprises like Apple. Uh, Apple, uh, for instance, in Europe, Apple has its uh, physical infrastructure in Ireland, but it operates in, in every country of the European Union. But it is taxed in on due to Irish relatively low corporate taxes. But their sales, the sales of Apple, other European countries is not so, um, Apple actually operates digitally in those countries. So global taxation agenda emerged after the financial crisis and the G20 actually authorized the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development to elaborate some uh, rules how to tax um, some digital multinational enterprises. And by the way, the Organization for Economic, Economic Cooperation and Development is mostly seen as an organization of developed countries. So we see here either large economies like G20 or developed countries like Organization for Education and Development are major actors of uh, global economic governance. Then global trade agenda is naturally dominated by World Trade Organization. Um, the organization under the UN um, architecture, which is called Nations Conference on Trade and Development, which was meant to regulate trade flows. Though actually uh, the mandate is nowadays uh, kind of divided by, by the uh, World Trade Organization is actually the primary actor in this case. Um, and by the way, within the WTO, WTO within the World Trade Organization, there are some clashes, um, contradictions between advanced economies and emerging markets. And they are really difficult to resolve. Like, like some developing countries want developed countries to open their agricultural markets. Like uh, the problem is always with the European Union. The prices uh, in the European Union, the food prices are much as uh, world prices for food. Uh, it means that actually the European Union needs to uh, impose higher import tariffs to protect uh, its price level and its internal market. But developed countries don't see it as a fair competition. They see it as, a, um, as an attempt uh, to protect. They see it as a kind of protectionism, which harms, by the way, sustainable development goals. It means that uh, actually developing countries won't receive enough money from their exports to the European Union. So there are many problems within uh, the existing um, organizations of world governance. Then global agenda on foreign direct investments, uh, so let's put it like simply uh, on investments, is by the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development. 
But the peculiarity is that actually the uh, this conference doesn't regulate or do doesn't govern the um, foreign direct investment. It um, rather counts, um, collects information, analyzes what's happening, uh, and that's it. Actually, um, what I'm going to say is that. Um, the UN is constantly challenged by other uh, financial organizations, trade organizations, and so on and so forth. Like, uh, UN is dealing with development, but global uh, official development agenda is dominated by uh, economic cooperation and development. So what are the pro fundamental problems? That UN actually doesn't provide a collective platform for all spheres the UN is mostly seen, as, a man, as um, Elena um, put it, uh, is mostly seen uh, as um, political organization, which is actually more about discussion. Um, and that is what I'm going to say, that uh, this is one of the most fundamental problems. The second fundamental problem deals with um, some contradictions, contradictions and clashes between developed and developing countries and their agendas to global development. Actually, there is a constant uh, dis const there are constant disputes about um, the reform of IMF, the reform of uh, decision making within the World Bank, and so on. But there are also some contradictions among developed economies, which also um, uh, which could also uh, make problems for the UN to be a universal platform for cooperation and for discussion. Uh, then a fundamental problem, number three, is that global agenda is not more an exclusive sphere of national governments. Uh, and here we're speaking about the role of multinational enterprises, increased role of global civil society, um, like here is an example of uh, increased role of MNEs, a uh, comparison of sales, uh, um, foreign sales and multinational enterprises and national experts. Um, um, so we see that actually that actually foreign sales of British Petroleum could be compared to Brazil's experts. Uh, and fundamental problem number four is um well there are naturally more of them but still fundamental problem number four is growing turbulences uh, across the globe pandemics and all uh, other kind of uh, problems actually some economists say we are living in the world of the so-called new normal it means that average growth rates would slowing would be slowing down and it would lead to um, uh, reduced economic dynamism and reduced predictability and increase competition. So in this case, maybe uh, there could be also a prospect for um, United Nations role in global economic development since it um, actually could possibly be a um, platform for some uh, cooperation. The civil society actually recommendations to the United Nations and to, re to reform the United Nations um, puts forward four uh, main goals uh, for the reform, which is uh, the increase the voice of people in government from developing countries, firstly, then include the full participation of all member states, not only for some uh, most influential ones, then genuinely respond to national and regional circumstances and priorities, uh, and actually the fourth one uh, to catalyze some uh, productive investment uh, and maybe the current uh, crisis and uh, the fact that we see the growing today's interdependence uh, between economies and between uh, national states um, would lead to some uh, kinds of reform since uh, almost all crises produce some new practices. And so it brings me to the end of my presentation. I um, didn't know so uh, mostly your uh, background and uh, your interests, so I would like to put it a bit simple and concise, so I hope it uh, was interesting, at least for someone. So, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Yegor. I will continue on a first-name basis, I hope you don't mind, and I would like to uh, ask uh, Elena uh, to come back uh, with us, um, because I think I'm going to ask her the first uh, question. 
Uh, so let's see if she can uh, join us again. And thank you, Yegor, uh, uh, again, because I, yeah, my first question immediately to Alena is, would you like to comment on uh, his um, uh, lecture? Because I, um, uh, I, 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 yeah, I, I liked the fact that he said uh, about the fundamental problems. Um, um, so yeah, if you could react to this, it would be interesting, I think, for us to hear. Sure, yeah. I mean, thanks very much um, uh, for a very interesting presentation. Um, I, I think it's exactly what Jörg has just said there. You've really focused on the fundamental problems. But what I really liked about what you were talking about, and perhaps you could say a little bit more about this, is this whole aspect of the UN is quite underdeveloped, right? The role of the UN in um, the global financial world and the global economic world. Because, of course, it's not often recognised that actually the IMF and the World Bank are part of the UN system, even though there's often very little communication between, at least public communication, between the public political part of the UN, because it's all politics, right? But the poli public political part in New York um, and in uh, Geneva, and then the relationship with those two uh, financial institutions. Um, and at the same time, we see an awful lot of criticism of the kind of development policies and practices that are sponsored by the UN, by the UN uh, banks, essentially the World Bank and IMF, mm -hmm. that are then criticized by, criticized by UN members. So I wonder if you could say something about the disparity, like why is there not a closer relationship between um, the UN's own financial instruments? Um, and secondly, wh where is the kind of space for uh, debate about the policies in the IMF? Because oftentimes they're criticized from the outside by um, specifically also non-state actors. Um, but there seems to be very little room for maneuver reflection internally. So um, just picking up on that kind of, since you focus so much on that kind of financial aspect. I wonder if you could say something about that. So yes, actually the problem with the International Monetary Fund, for instance, um, is that it, it's, um, well, the, the main problem is decision-making nature. Uh, the votes are uh, distributed unproportionately, um, not, um, well, not um, according to the um, sovereignty of states. So each state doesn't have um, their, its own one vote within the National Monetary Fund, but uh, the votes are distributed um, by um, the uh, scope of economy share in the world economy. Uh, so, and there are uh, voting shares within the world economy. So, the the very um, issue of reforming the IMF is uh, reforming a voting system. Uh, so, like every decision within the IMF could be blocked by majority or my minority, sorry, 15% of votes casted. But uh, 60 or 17% of um, votes is held by the S. So, the mm -hmm. S can actually uh, block any decision the IMF um, takes. The second problem is um, the uh, economic principles and economic additionality of the International Monetary Fund. So, um, you know that uh, International Monetary Fund have some conditional uh, uh, credits to developing countries and almost unconditional to developed ones. Mm -hmm. Actually, the problem here with communication to developed nations is that uh, developed and developing countries common ground to um, negotiate all those problems. There are rounds of forming IMF, but the essence actually is the same. The developers dominate the agenda and dominate the regulation of the National Monetary Fund system. So some of countries, some of countries which are already relatively powerful, like China, for instance, uh, they um, decided not to um, follow some rules, uh, some principles of um, international monetary fund policies, um, and they elaborate their own alternative financial resources to influence already other developing countries. So the, the very essential problems are lying in the field of um, different interest, interests of countries, nations, and increasing number of actors, just to make it more general. Yep. And the second, um, actually, uh, the second question about space for debate. Um, well, the the, oh, the every debate nowadays deals with uh, speaking about IMF deals with uh, reform, um, and the principal agreement actually is 
but um, further steps are not taken. I hope you, I answered your question. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you both uh, also. And I, uh, we see that, of course, uh, in, in, in both your uh, presentations and, and what we see around us in the world, of course, it, it has all to do with all the different actors uh, everywhere with all their own um, uh, well policies behind them. Um, uh, I'm going to uh, ask a few questions. And what we what we see, uh, basically, Alain, is what you started with, um, uh, with your presentation, that we focus mainly uh, when we think about the UN, we think about the blue helmets. Uh, we think about the the, the military uh, uh, part of the of the UN. Um, and while in this lecture we won't be going into separate uh, conflicts uh, around the world, um, but I still think it's it's relevant as an example. Uh, is the current um, um, yeah, crisis? There's of course a war going on in uh, Nagorno-Karabakh between Armenia and Azerbaijan. Um, and basically the question is of course. Um, um, why did no one step in or why didn't the UN uh, step in and maybe then connected to that question was another question uh, how do uh, you evaluate the possibility to prevent World War III uh, for example uh, by, by the UN um, um, so without going into the into the conflict itself um, okay. if yeah I'm going to answer the second part of the question first um, Preventing World War III, well, we've already done that for 75 years. So this, you know, the classic defense of the UN is that there actually hasn't been a world war since the UN was created. Um, now, that doesn't mean there hasn't been war. And in fact, there hasn't been, you know, increasing conflict between states. And, and that brings us very nicely to the first question. Um, why has nobody done anything? Um, this is a classic example of exactly what I was talking about. There is no political will to put this uh, to the Security Council um, because nobody wants to pay for peacekeeping force uh, for that conflict because it's seen to be a direct um, conflict between two states um, over a disputed region. So it brings up all kinds of very difficult questions for the UN about sovereignty, about the limits of sovereignty, because I know that that's one of the issues um, uh, in that conflict about the question of self-determination of peoples. Um, because this is related, of course, to a majority group inside another state. Um, and those are very tricky questions for the UN because um, it really opens up the very fundamental principles of what it means to be a state. And so that's the kind of um, conceptual reason that the UN, I think, is very hesitant to engage in that. And by the way, you see that a lot. So interstate conflicts um, oftentimes um, either don't ever come up at the UN or are deliberately kept from the UN because the UN doesn't want to get into those questions of why some people have sovereignty in one place but other people don't have sovereignty even though there's, their situation might be similar. And the other reason is national interest, right? So that conflict is, you know, in many ways fueled by two other powers, Turkey and Russia, who have an interest in keeping it going because it's a question of natural resources. Now, I'm not getting into whether or not that's um, a part of it, because I'm not an expert in the conflict, but that is another reason why it, they don't want to debate it in public, because they don't want to talk about the motivations for that conflict. They don't want to talk about what they will or won't do. Um, and also, in many cases, you have to remember that um, the UN can't, although it has the mandate to create peace, it can't just go in anywhere that it wants. It's not a global police force. And that's something that I think it's really important to understand. Should the UN be in there? Absolutely. This is what we designed the UN for. This is a classic example of the UN not doing what it should do when it's required. But can the UN go in there without uh, even being able to debate this at the Security Council? No, they cannot. So actually, where the pressure should be put is on other countries uh, and their representatives and on public opinion to highlight and to keep focus on this question so that it can be brought to the Security Council. So if we can get it onto the Security Council agenda, then we can have an open and public debate about what can be done about peace relief efforts, about humanitarian aid, about um, all those kinds of issues related to the conflict. So that's, and that's, all I'll say. Yeah. yeah, no, thank you very much. I think it's a very clear uh, answer um, and also perhaps an advice uh, to the members of the of the United uh, Nations. Uh, Yegor, would you care to comment also maybe on the, uh, because you you, you focused uh, part, uh, partly on the financial aspects uh, of the of the uh, relations in the, between different states uh, and you mentioned also uh, for example that uh, some uh, big corporates, uh, they have bigger sales than some countries have uh, uh, export um, and of course in the region uh, there is oil. Does that play a role here uh, or what is your perhaps personal opinion um... well I try to answer this question uh, first of all um, 
maybe this conflict is even too difficult to resolve like by uh, the UN intervention because it deals with many um, cultural, political, economic, geographical even problems. Um, and by the way, there are many external actors to this conflict, like Turkey is backing Azerbaijan, uh, officially is distancing, but uh, uh, distance. But um, there is an agreement between Russia and Armenia to, for uh, um, possible military support. So um, actually, uh, it is potentially a very dangerous region and a very dangerous situation, unfortunately. Um, and uh, there is no simple decision to this problem. Uh, as to the oil, um, actually, um, the oil plays a role here uh, since Azerbaijan is a major exporter of oil. Actually, almost 80% of um, Azerbaijan's export is oil and oil products and petroleum products, but mostly oil. So it has constant uh, financial backing, which Armenia lacks because Armenia is a net importer, not only on go of goods and services, but of energy goods. It depends on uh, imports of energy, it depends on imports of international investments, and so on and so forth. So economic conditions um, are a bit um, in danger, endangered by the overall situation. And Armenia is also um, in a kind of um, um, dangerous situation surrounded by uh, foes, which, by countries which Armenia considers to be foes. So. Yep. Yeah, no, indeed, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's it's not the easiest uh, conflict to uh, to solve, uh, obviously. Um, uh, diverting from that, uh, Elena, a question to you. Um, uh, a question was if you could give an example of a recent UN successful decision, action, uh, perhaps even this year, outside of the big politics, when many nations uh, unanimously agreed and did some good for another, possibly small, smaller, poorer, less developed nation or population. Um, the first example that comes to mind is the passing in September of the resolution um, on the agreement to um, carry forward the spirit of multilateralism. So it's really a, a kind of a restating of countries' commitments to multilateral action through the UN. Um, and the, in many ways, this was uh, deliberately generated by the 75th anniversary to get countries to recommit or to restate their multilateral um commitments and their promises to cooperate. So that's something that was just passed by the security by the General Assembly in the September session. But another resolution that they passed that kind of didn't, you know, again, just what I was talking about, the way that we kind of also the media reports on the UN. So that resolution on the spirit of multilateralism got some public attention because it was also pushed forward very much by um, um, non-state actors and by um, think tanks and those kind of um, organizations. But another resolution that I think is in fact even more important, and it's a pity that they didn't manage to publicize this, was they passed a resolution um, by 131 votes about um, the promise to implement um, the Secretary General's report on the causes of conflict and ways to create durable peace in African conflicts. Um, and that was a very kind of, I think very, very important resolution to pass 131 votes is, um, is a good majority. It's a two thirds majority needed to pass something in the General Assembly. And that resolution is not just a kind of a, um, a kind of a verbal commitment, if you like, to multilateralism, because we can always all make this right. Um, but that was actually a commitment to um, generate policies um, and programs and implement um, recommendations by the UN to create durable peace in African conflicts. Um, based on you know research um, specifically generated for that report, so I think that's a very good example of one thing okay. that the UN has done. It's not about power politics, and Russia voted for it. So you see again, right? This is not this would not have been expected if we were to hold to our traditional views of what Russia does at the UN. 
No, no. I think that's also very important that we show uh, and that you show uh, the the um, another picture of the what we normally read in the newspaper or get on the news, uh, which is now obviously a very big issue when there are so many channels um, where you can get all the kind of news that you are looking for or might not be looking for. A uh, question to you both, um, uh, you because you both mentioned also the sustainable development goals, and I, I would like to mention before I ask you the question that everybody can uh, commit to the sustainable development goals. You don't need to be a nation or a state or a big company uh, we had a lecture about it before also um, but how much uh, yeah does Russia do uh, to to fulfill the development goals um, and is it enough seen by other members I don't know it's a, I find it possibly a difficult question uh, um, but how is it perhaps then also as a follow-up question uh, being perceived within the UN is it really a huge deal that that countries really need to uh, uh, well take a stake in and maybe uh, Yegor maybe you can start what is your take on this uh, the role of Russia uh, the sustainable development goals so uh, Russia uh, begs sustainable development goals and uh, there are several uh, several initiatives um, the last one is to reduce uh, the uh, emissions to the level of 70 percent of the year 1990 um, though the problem is that actually it is already reduced due to some deindustrialization of the country, but uh, never mind. Um, well, uh, the uh, sustainable development goals are uh, more about <clears throat> some fundamental problem: poverty, hunger, um, and some of them are um, um, already actually met in Russia because there are no absolute poor people. Um, uh, in speaking about official um, development aid and or official assistance. Um, it it it, um, it depends on what we understand under systems. Like Russia, for instance, doesn't have much uh, development aid to some developing countries. Though actually, in the countries are also not quite good at uh, providing official development aid. The targets are not met by developed countries. Um, but um, Russia, um, for instance, many. Um, uh, workplaces, many jobs to um, at least to neighboring countries, like 30% of uh, Kyrgyz Republic's GDP comes from remittances of migrants working in Russia. Uh, almost the same situation um, with Tajikistan. So um, maybe the strategy is not officially forfeited, uh, but there are some of, uh, Russia's contributing to sustainable development goals, if I put it like that. Okay, thank you. Elena, would you care to comment? Well, I won't speak to Russia's performance on sustainable development goals because I think uh, that Igor has just done that pretty well. Um, but what I would say is that um, the sustainable development goals should really be considered as a kind of a roadmap for countries. So some of the really big targets like no poverty and zero hunger, they're of course very important and very admirable, but they are very ambitious. And even without a pandemic, I think it would have been unlikely that we would achieve those. So the question um, I think that often people ask about the sustainable development goals, and I think it's inherent in what you've just asked, is, um, is it really realistic that we'll actually achieve these by 2030 um, with 10 years to go? Um, and and are they you know ever possible? Will it ever be possible that there's no hunger and no zero hunger and no poverty? Um, and I think that it's worth restating that two things about sustainable development goals we have to remember is that they signify political agreements between states on these questions. So if we don't have something like the UN asking states to commit to make progress towards those issues then firstly, it's impossible to know whether or not states actually take seriously those kind of problems. And secondly, we encourage them to share their resources in terms of solving those problems and solving um, those issues. And something like zero hunger, you can um, maybe a state can um, achieve this within its territories, but something like climate change, you know, this is essentially a problem of global governance that cannot be solved by one state. Nope. Now, the second thing I just want to say about sustainable development goals is that we, we shouldn't really expect um, to have great debate about whether or not countries achieve these targets 
um, in a very international way. There will be reports, but I mean, I don't know if anybody really is interested in reading those. What we should see beyond the commitments of the big leaders on this question is, um, can you see the sustainable development goals around you, right? So do you see them implemented at a, a local level, at a city level, by provincial authorities, by municipal authorities? Are there, you know, small things like there's been a campaign at my university this year, is our university sustainable? And we found out that it wasn't. <laughs> so, it, you know, it spends too much energy. But these are the kind of issues. That's where you really measure the success of sustainable development goals. If you can see it every day you step outside your door, being implemented by local uh, authorities and local communities and individuals. Um, I think that the, the international conversation is a little bit less important because everybody wants to be seen to do well at that level. Yeah, yeah, I agree, and of course, it's also it's, it 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 points perhaps a little bit towards a di another discussion uh, that uh, we won't uh, have tonight. But uh, the the distance between, of course, uh, say us uh, uh, people on the on the ground and the big institutions, uh, that we don't always feel connected, of course, to them. And and the, and the thing with the sustainable development goals is, of course, very much that they are part of uh, of our everyday life, uh, basically. Um, um, a very specific question to you, uh, Elena. Um, um, how could you estimate the role of the medium and small countries in peacekeeping matter, in particular at present, while they become non-permanent members in UNSC? For example, also the Netherlands, but also Denmark. Um, so I'm going to use another example. I'm going to talk about Ireland, right? So that's, that's where I'm from. Yep. Um, Ireland has just been elected to the Security Council as a non-permanent member for the next session from um, January onwards. Um, so, of course, I'm going to say that it's an incredibly important role and, and small and medium powers there are very important at the UN. Um, but I do think that this is a very interesting topic, right? Um, now, obviously, small and medium powers don't have the same kind of... Um, impact or power as larger powers they don't have the same resources they don't have the same material resources to contribute to peacekeeping um but they do two important things and the first one is that we often see small and medium powers and, and the ones that are in the example canada i think denmark you mentioned and also ireland they're traditionally seen as more neutral actors so they play a very important role um, in encouraging states to get involved in peacekeeping missions to contribute troops to even bring questions of peace and security to the security council to the to the resolution table um so small and medium powers are very good interlocutors in generating support or you know uh, prohibiting support for certain peace and security issues um so in any of the conflicts that we see the un involved in Small and medium powers play a political role that's very, very important in keeping that conversation going at an international level. But they also play an important role in um, providing troops and um, providing um, material resources for peacekeeping and peace building. Um, and in many cases, actually, what's really interesting, uh, and again, you know, lesser known fact about the UN, the P5 are not good troop contributing countries. China is, is one of the top three, but actually I think the number one troop, contrib uh, troop contributing country is Indonesia. So um, these, you know, this is something that's not realized. It's not the permanent five members who most often send all their men and, and, and money um, and women, of course, to peace fielding missions. It's actually mostly done by, again, often small and medium powers and sometimes largely from the global south. So I think they have an incredibly important and totally underestimated role in that respect yeah yeah i think uh, again uh, if, if if something comes forward from uh, from both your lectures is that we should look beyond uh, really the things that we are uh, reading or thinking that we know because there are so many actors at stake but also so many things done of course that we we yeah, we simply have not enough information about and that's why I, i'm also liking this lecture uh, one more question and then i will i will i will finalize after this uh, and i think there should be but are there any special supporting programs of ethnical minorities uh, i can imagine that i don't know if that's a very specific question if you would know that uh, elena there's support, support programs. Uh, supporting pro yeah, for ethnical minorities. Does the UN uh, have such a body that? Um, I, I don't think so. I mean, there's some specialized offices that are rep that try to represent minority groups. Um, and there's certainly in the General Assembly, there is space for representation of NGOs who represent those minorities. I, I think I'll say one important thing about that is that. The UN actually has, in some cases, quite a good record of advocating for minorities. So if we think of the conflicts in South Africa um, and also in um, 
in, in kind of that region in general in Central and Southern Africa. Minority groups often got a hearing at the UN um, where uh, other questions and, and, and spaces didn't, particularly in the fourth committee of the General Assembly. So if you want to know more about that, I would look at what are the issues on the fourth and fifth committees of the General Assembly and who are the actors who are getting their questions on the table there. Okay. Well, uh, thank you very much. Yes. Some uh, UNESCO does some activities in uh, the fears of ethnic minorities, their cultures, protection of their cultures. So some of them are really working answering the question of uh, Marina. Marina, yes. Sorry. Thank you very much. Yes, no, but so you see, uh, there's so many huge uh, organizations uh, uh, that we are discussing here. Of course, it's impossible to mention what they are all doing. Uh, but thank you both very much for painting a, a bigger and wider picture. Um, uh, and we see also from the questions uh, that, that, that it actually brings up a lot of uh, thought because everybody knows what you're talking about, but nobody, I guess, really knows what, what it's all about. Um, and I think it's very special that uh, uh, on the in the year that the United Nations exists for 75 years that we could have this lecture. So I would like to thank uh, Professor Sergeyev uh, for joining us today and for Professor O'Malley. Um, um, you can, uh, and I'm saying this to the attendees, thank you very much for being here today. Uh, uh, it's very easy to find Yegor Sergeyev at MGIMO University. Uh, Elena O'Malley you can find at Leiden University. She's on Twitter, so you can follow her very easily. She tweets all uh, uh, interesting articles. Um, and you can find their profiles both very easily online and uh, see what they've been writing about and, uh, and uh, what uh, books they have published. Um, I really want to thank you both again. It was a, a huge pleasure for us. Uh, and we wish you both good luck in your teachings and research. Uh, we in, uh, hope you will enjoy your evening. And to all the attendees again, thank you very much for being here with us today. Uh, you will uh, be updated about next lectures, of course, via email. Uh, wishing you all a very nice uh, evening uh, and looking forward to seeing you all soon again. Keep safe. Thanks. Thank you. Yes, you can both log off uh, if you want, and I will contact you also via email. Uh, have a very nice evening. Thank you. Thank you, Elena. Thank you, Igor. Thank you. Bye-bye.